Welcome to this uh, program uh, where we focus on digital transformation and the uh, effects of the fourth industrial revolution. Um, I will uh, first uh, hand it over to the president of BI Norwegian uh, Business School uh, uh, to welcome you all and introduce our panelists. My name is Peder Inge Fuchet. I'm a professor at BI, and I will take you through this uh, session after this uh, introduction. Uh, over to you, uh, Inge on hand, yourself. Thank you, Peder Inge, and uh, welcome to this uh, webinar. Good afternoon to all of you. Um, as uh, we have uh, written in the invitation, digital technologies are dramatically reshaping different industries. And organizations are looking at their possibilities to make imperative changes in the efforts to survive, to maintain profits, or simply to keep up with competitors. At BI, and in higher education, uh, not only in Norway, but uh, all across the world, the pandemic has been a disruptive force for change, as I guess also in many industries. Uh, discussions on how to use digital technology in teaching and learning has been moved forward at least 10 years, the last two years. So the future is here and now. And uh, the last... Uh, uh, news from uh, the situation in Ukraine and what is happening in the world is also showing that digital technology has become a weapon of war. So today we have invited uh, Berge Brenda and Hegis Griset to discuss the effects of the fourth industrial revolution. And Professor Christian Fiesler at BIA will present ongoing research on digital transformation and artificial intelligence. And um, Peter Inge, that you have already met, will facilitate the discussion and present insights from his latest book. So, Berge Brende is the president of the World Economic Forum, uh, the International Organization for Public-Private uh, Cooperation. And previously, Berge Brende was Norwegian Minister of Foreign Affairs, Minister of Environment, and Minister of Trade and Industry. And he has served as member of parliament for the Norwegian Conservative Party for more than a decade. Hegis Griset is the executive vice president, uh, Kongsberg Group, and president, Kongsberg Digital. Christian Fiesler is professor for communication management at BI Norwegian Business School, and he is the founding director for the Nordic Center for Internet and Society. And Peter Inge Fuset, that you have already met, is a professor of innovation at BI Norwegian Business School. So uh, to make it short, I would uh, finish by welcoming you all to this uh, seminar and give the word back to you, Peder Inge. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Inge Jan. And uh, again, a warm welcome to uh, everyone inside Norway and uh, beyond. And uh, welcome also to uh, Berge Brend, uh, Hegis Griset and Christian Fiesler. Uh, very glad to see you all. Uh, these are challenging, challenging times. Um, but the fourth industrial revolution and uh, digital transformation is getting uh, more and more uh, relevant for us. So in this uh, hour long program, I would like uh, to invite Berge Brende to start, to give us an, an uh, update and uh, insight on the Davos agenda 2022 uh, and how, how that looks. And then I will follow up a little bit with, with some questions for uh, Berge Brende, and then I'll uh, uh, um, talk with Hege Skuset and Christian Fiesler as well. And uh, let us just make this an uh, informal event where we use the opportunity to communicate with each other to try to enlighten as much the topic of digital transformation and, um, and the fourth industrial revolution. Uh, so, Berge Brende, it's uh, nice to talk to you again. Uh, you're so well welcome to be on this uh, program. We, we spoke about one year ago uh, on the same program, and uh, things have definitely uh, changed. But let us try to keep the focus on digital transformation this time. So, please give us an, uh, an update on the Davos agenda 
and um, what is going on in, in the World Economic Forum regarding these and related topics. No, thank you so much. Uh, great to uh, see you all again. Uh, thank you for being uh, invited. Um, sending my best regards here from uh, Geneva. And as you just uh, underlined, uh, the world has definitely changed uh, compared to last uh, time we met. And unfortunately, not to the better. I don't think we can have uh, this discussion, even if it's informal without also sending our solidarity uh, of, to the people of uh, Ukraine. Uh, this uh, is unfortunately a re-establishing uh, this notion of a Cold War, um, at least uh, in Europe, and it will have impact uh, for decades uh, to come. We know that there has been competition um, before, but this is uh, really, really uh, something um, totally um, different. We have seen uh, in the field of uh, digital transformation uh, and the internet um, a bit of a decoupling uh, during the last years. You spoke about the internet, someone then launched this notion of a splinter net because of uh, building uh, different uh, systems. I think still in the digital world um, there is um, cooperation and there are um, based on some of uh, the same platforms and I do hope that also in the years to come that uh, that can be the case and that we use the new technologies in the interest of humankind. The new technologies being artificial intelligence as you already uh, mentioned, being the internet of things, how to connect uh, all these different uh, devices, uh, being also um, digital currencies, uh, and etc. Uh, let's make sure that this uh, can be tools in solving the most pressing issues in the world. We, for example, know that artificial intelligence can be put uh, to work uh, for energy um, efficiency, it can create jobs, but also can uh, do its part in uh, mitigating uh, CO2 uh, emissions. But uh, the whole digital world, as the rector also underlined at the outset, uh, has um, leapfrogged during uh, the COVID. Um, we know that uh, we would probably not have met like this uh, just two, three years ago. People would not like zoom in uh, to a big virtual event like this. But this is only uh, the tip of the iceberg. I think the new technologies that we're dealing with here will be extremely, extremely consequential. And what we saw also uh, before this crisis um, and the war and the invasion uh, that is um, totally unacceptable in Ukraine was that there already was a quite tough competition between the G2 being the two largest economies in the world, the US and also China, uh, altogether more than 40% of the global uh, GDP on who is on top of the new technologies. And both these two countries know that those that are on top of the new technologies are also going to be the most prosperous and uh, nation in the world. And things are changing so incredibly fast. So uh, my last point before we maybe go into a dialogue and before uh, telling um, one story that uh, I experienced yesterday is that we, I think we have a hard time grasping how fast things change. And if you look at um, the 10 companies with the highest market cap in the world today, at least before the oil price went up to 130 US dollars, out of the 10 companies, seven of them are no technology companies. And seven of them did not exist 20 years ago. I think we tend to forget that. And we tend to forget that with the speed of the development uh, now, uh, also like, for example, big data being the new oxy oxygen in the world economy, many of the most consequential companies in two decades are not even started yet. Maybe their idea is not even invented yet. And to handle that, 
you have to be very innovative and very entrepreneurial and you have to be very open-minded. So last uh, point, the story. Yesterday I was asked, um, um, and this is re referencing your first point of how bad things look today, I was asked how, how is really uh, the geopolitical situation today? And I did say, and I hope I'm wrong, I said definitely worse than um, uh, last year, but I, I'm afraid better than next year. I hope I'm wrong. Over to you. Yes, uh, thank you uh, so far. Uh, of course, um, the solidarity with Ukraine, we all uh, support. And uh, uh, there's a grave concern about uh, whether we will actually enter a Cold War. Uh, it's all seemed uh, sort of uh, totally uh, not a topic just two weeks ago. Um, but if we then turn our attention to um, this, this topic of, you know, utilizing digital technologies to create value, and, and that could be sort of a short clarification about what digital transformation is. Um, my viewpoint is that it's basically the transformation that is the most important word in the term of digital transformation. It is the changes that we can make inside companies uh, and entities uh, in public and private sector and to create new value to uh, stimulate our um, societies, uh, indeed. So if we, um, uh, let me put a, pull up a page here uh, from uh, the World Economic Forum. You can see this page uh, now, can't you? Yeah. Um, so it's, this is a, just a, a part of your recent article in February of this year, where uh, you typically then present digital transformation as uh, sort of a topic for the midterm, sort of five to 10 years uh, uh, out. And um, it's important to ensure technology and innovation uh, are part of the DNA of, of firms and companies and institutions around uh, the globe. So um, based on the last events of the couple of weeks, would you, would you sort of uh, stress that this work needs to um, be even have a stronger focus? Uh, should we, should we uh, continue our work with digital transformation and, and looking five to 10 years out or should the, we uh, try to uh, even focus even more on digital transformation? Uh, What's your uh, idea there? Uh, if, if you wanted a very short answer, I would say uh, definitely we should uh, give it uh, even a higher priority because it will accelerate. Uh, it is uh, not uh, something that can be stopped or should be uh, stopped. But digital uh, transformation, we also have to get it right. And one of my concerns is that they can also um, underpin already the differences in the world. Uh, we take it for granted that we can meet like that, uh, this. But remember that 3.6 billion people are not connected uh, with broadband or in an efficient way like we're doing now. And how can, for example, a developing country leapfrog if they don't even have uh, the access uh, to the internet and stable uh, internet. So that's why the World Economic Forum also has launched the so-called Edison Initiative. We have leading companies from the world and governments coming together and say, we will need in the five coming years to close that um, digital gap between um, the developed world and the developing world. If you look at it more, as I think you're uh, alluding to inside a company, uh, we have seen that COVID has been the biggest uh, digital transformator in any uh, company, more than any CTOs, because uh, we had to change. I saw it here at the World Economic Forum too. We did not have this studio that I'm now sitting in uh, two years ago. Uh, in two weeks, we built two studios at our headquarters uh, here in uh, Geneva. The only way we could then communicate with our 700 partners of leading companies in the world was uh, through um, uh, the digital piece. 
If a company is not part of the digital transformation, applying the new technologies, producing higher up in the value chain, they will easily end up uh, like Kodak. Or if Microsoft did not launch the iCloud, didn't go in the cloud, they would end up as other companies in that field that uh, are not competitive any, uh, anymore. So I think the basic learning is that if you don't have people in your company or in your organization always pushing, always being the enfant terrible, saying, oh, this is not good enough, we have to be more innovative, we have to apply these technologies, one has to hire that person immediately. So if we look at some other uh, numbers that are striking in the world, um, for example, 2.9 billion people have never used the internet. And uh, 1.4 billion people uh, don't have access to electricity uh, currently. How can an organization like uh, World Economic Forum contribute to uh, making situations like this uh, better? So, um, happy to answer that question. Let me put it a little bit in the context. What we are now faced with after the COVID is that many governments have used all their fiscal ammunition and a little bit more in fighting um, uh, this turning into a depression instead of a recession. The reason why the global economy is again growing is that we put 13 trillion US dollars into action. We never launched that much stimulus since uh, the Second World War. But that also comes with a cost because many countries are now indebted. And we still have a lot of things that has have to happen, being the digital uh, divide, being uh, the 700 million people in the world that don't even have access to electricity, a lot of development issues. And if we are going to make a difference, we cannot only count on governmental money. I think companies and private sector that is still not indebted, at least not all of the companies, many are very profitable, we also have to make them part of the solution and we have to mobilize them, like we did in the Edison um, initiative, as I just um, mentioned, to connect the 3.6 billion that are not connected to the internet. We did it with a trillion trees. We used to have like double the amount of trees on our planet um, uh, in the past, uh, but we then mobilized global companies to then pledge uh, contributions so we could plant one trillion trees uh, in the coming years. They uh, create jobs, but it also mitigates their important sink uh, for climate change and etc. So what your World Economic Forum is now doing in all these fields is to make sure that we also held the private um, sector accountable, but we also see that the private sector is much more eager than in the past to play a role there. I was at the COP26 in Glasgow, I, I think I was at my first COP like more than 20 years ago when I was Minister uh, of the Environment and I didn't see any business CEOs there in Marrakesh in 2001. It was only bureaucrats and politicians sitting there negotiating commas, moving paragraphs and all this and no, there were more business people than there were ministers in Glasgow and that was a good thing because the most interesting things happening was how we were going to use the new technologies in the interest of um, CO2 uh, mitigation. So I believe uh, in the years to come uh, it will be critical to mobilize the private sector. So if we think about Norway for a bit, uh, what, uh, how, can, how can Norway contribute to try to solve some of these problems and how how could or how should Norwegian companies uh, contribute to, um, to tr trying to solve these problems? First, I have to say that many Norwegian companies are very committed uh, in this field, being ESGs, being more like stakeholder capitalism, being on climate change. Look at what Yara is doing on fertilizer and food production. Uh, look at the ambitions many of the Norwegian companies are set to be net zero by 2050. A lot has happened. But I think uh, in the years to come, I think Norwegian companies uh, will have to do even more uh, to contribute uh, not only to a digital transformation in Norway, but in the world. I think also they have to do more 
to uh, put even stricter um, measures on their suppliers. If a company uh, of uh, a big size say, we will only buy products uh, from suppliers that are greening their supply chains, are emitting less CO2, for example, that's really, really making a difference. Because we obviously, for the time being, cannot agree on a global uh, CO2 price, so there's no global CO2 uh, tax. But if a big company uh, says that we will only buy if you fulfill these and these criteria, no country can take you to court for that. It is up to the private sector. If you use your own money, you can ask for whatever you want as long as it is legal. And it's not fortunately legal, it's just um, very smart to also then play a role in moving uh, the supply chain and then companies that are supplying also have to do a better job. So at the, thank you. So at this, this point in the conversation, I would like to uh, invite Hege Skriset to uh, sort of uh, join us um, while we have this uh, panel. Um, uh, hello, Heg. Uh, nice to have you with us. And I actually understand that uh, uh, you, Heg Skriset, and Berge Brenda, you have met before. Uh, so you know each other a little bit. Hello. Hey, Hege. Hi, how are you? Very good. Thank you, Sala. Likewise. We actually met in the Philippines the last time, so... We did. Okay. Um, so, so Berge Brenda sort of gave in... Um, uh, challenge here to Norwegian companies, um, which which kind of come goes on. Well, you could could think about green aspects whenever you uh, purchase and so on. But but first, uh, hey, excuse me, please give us a, uh, a short introduction about uh, Kongsberg uh, and and Kongsberg Digital. Uh, which you uh, had, and uh, you know, this is a very impressive company, uh, important in the history of Norway uh, for for value creation and so on. So uh, let's hear a li first a little bit about Kongsberg and Kongsberg Digital, uh, Hege. Yeah. So just a quick uh, uh, introduction to the company first, and then I'm going to talk about the industries that we are working with and how we are supporting both efficiency. Uh, transformation and also uh, sustainable development. Uh, so, but uh, we are a five year old company. It was formed uh, as out of uh, Kongsberg uh, five years ago uh, to contribute into the transformation of uh, energy uh, and maritime industries. So we are now 720 employees. We have 33 nationalities and uh, more than 80% of the revenues are outside of Norway. So we are definitely contributing around the world. And uh, we are also representatives in 20 countries um, in different uh, parts of the world. So uh, the focus around maritime and energy was clear to us, uh, given both uh, the legacy of Kongsberg and uh, the strong positions that we have in those areas, but also predominantly because these two are so vital and so important uh, for our everyday life, uh, both when it comes to transportation, when it comes to goods, uh, the maritime industry um, supports uh, transportation of more than 80% of the goods in the world, so really in the center of globalization. Uh, and also to the fact that both of these two industries uh, was not the first movers into digitalization, but now they are coming uh, with significant uh, power into it. Uh, so what is really going on? Uh, what are we um, uh, helping these companies to accomplish? Uh, on the energy side, we are in the middle of a technology transformation at the same time as it is an energy transition. Uh, so moving towards more green energy sources, uh, but at the same time ensuring that we make the current energy sources uh, more sustainable uh, and ensure uh, reliability as we transist. Uh, so it's very much about getting integrated energy sources, uh, also uh, making uh, the challenges that we currently are facing with uh, some of the new energy sources when it comes to storage, uh, so that it's possible to integrate these uh, towards uh, the traditional energy sources. When it comes to the maritime industry, I would say this is uh, vital, as I mentioned, uh, when it comes to the globalization. 
uh, this industry is now facing a transition when it comes to fueling, uh, which is, of course, important from a climate perspective. Uh, but it's also important to, to look into the overall value chain and how it operates today uh, to ensure that it uh, modernize and become more efficient uh, in the future. So hybrid fueling uh, is of essence. Uh, we see ship owners now uh, ordering uh, vessels with um, uh, ammonia, with uh, hydrogen, uh, but we don't see the infrastructure there yet. Uh, so it's important for different parts of the industry to come together and ensure both on the energy side, storage opportunities uh, and getting the infrastructures uh, ready so that we can start using less polluting uh, fueling uh, in the future. Uh, so these are some of the key areas that we are working on. And then, of course, when it comes to uh, renewable energy sources um, and uh, established energy sources, uh, it's of essence uh, to create structures where these can interlink uh, so that you get uh, reliability uh, and also get stability at the same time as you are reducing CO2 emissions. Uh, so we very much uh, look forward to this and I think we are bringing a lot of innovation into this space uh, and helping customers all over the world. Yeah, it's uh, certainly um, a lot of interesting aspects in what Kongsberg and uh, Kongsberg Digital are doing. And uh, if we shortly turn it back to um, Berg Brende, uh, uh, feel free to comment upon what uh, Hege Skrisa just mentioned as some of the contributions that the company is making worldwide and to the greening of the economy. Um, well, what's your thinking about, for example, Kongsberg here in Norway? They're also uh, world leading uh, in uh, some of these aspects uh, on the maritime sector. I think when we met in the Philippines, it was uh, the launch of this uh, surveillance system or a system for how to manage one of the most complicated ports in the world, was it? Uh, yeah, yeah. If I'm, yeah, if I'm, I'm right, and uh, so that's a world-leading uh, technology. I, I just uh, hope that uh, Norwegian companies um, will keep investing uh, in uh, research and uh, development that is necessary. And I also do hope that uh, in Norway could spend more uh, of its uh, resources. And now I think the tax revenues are going up quite dramatically these days. I would allocate. Uh, this into uh, research and development uh, related to digital transformation, but also um, overall. I, I think the, the best thing now is to invest uh, in this. And I would add, and that's of course a little bit of a political comment, not really related to this. I, I, I would also uh, do uh, invest a bit in resilience and uh, increase the defense spendings, but also that is, has a digital component, of course. So we are uh, at least uh, able to defend our countries uh, for a few days uh, before we need allied support. I think that's the cheapest insurance premium we could pay. And I think there is a lot of naivety around this. So we really need to step up both of them. Political message from Geneva. Do <laughs> <laughs> you have any comment there, Hege? Excuse it. No, I think you're bringing up uh, very vital and important points, uh, Bergen. Uh, but uh, I would say that uh, it's a bit uh, fragmented uh, still, this uh, discussion uh, when it comes to uh, energy transition. Uh, so there are some fundamentals that need to come in place. And of course, uh, from a geopolitical standpoint, and you know more about this than me, um, it's also important that we have a reliable energy source uh, over the uh, coming uh, years. And with the situation we are facing now in Ukraine and Russia, it's, uh, it's challenging. No, if I might comment, I, I, I think it's, uh, it's, it's, it's critical. And we are uh, in a situation if, if the energy prices and especially oil uh, prices continue uh, to be at this uh, level uh, in the years to come, uh, it can also uh, kill uh, the recovery that we're in the middle of. 
And if you know, then go into a situation with increased inflation, less global economic growth, and we have less uh, ammunition fiscally to stimulate the economy, as I was mentioning uh, previously, uh, we really uh, can end up uh, in an uh, impasse. But at the same time, you can say that if oil and gas is higher priced, there will be more technology developed uh, on energy efficiency, and there will be more focus on also alternative um, sources. So uh, it is a, a dramatic increase uh, in the price for fossil fuel over time that can lead uh, to uh, um, accelerated transformation, but not overnight. That is the problem. That's uh, a huge uh, challenge. And when I look at energy, I see energy security, energy access, and uh, as two um, very important components. And then, of course, the third one uh, is decoupling growth from C growth in CO2 emissions. Yeah, and uh, if I may add to that, it's uh, reliability and stability. Uh, so, because one of the key challenges uh, that we haven't still uh, solved uh, is uh, storage on uh, renewable energy. Uh, so so um, uh, that uh, is an area where the industries need to come together uh, and really double down on uh, storage. And I would say being a significant uh, uh, contributor into the maritime industry, I think we have uh, more than one third of uh, the world's fleet uh, within the Kongsberg portfolio, meaning we are delivering um, advanced solutions and, and uh, and components to them. Um, I think it's also very important uh, to, to, to uh, start this infrastructure uh, planning when it comes to new fueling uh, area types, because uh, that's still a uh, very vague and, uh, and uh, not planned for. Well, let us uh, <clears throat> turn the uh, part of the discussion into uh, the fields of research, uh, which has been mentioned directly or indirectly by, the, by both of you. Um, if I if I may, so my viewpoint is that uh, Norway is is investing way too little into uh, research um, and development. Um, for example, Finland spends three to four times uh, the money that Norway uh, spends on this annually. Um, we have seen an increase in Norway, but but still we're trailing company, uh, countries like Finland and and uh, Norway's. Uh, place on innovation rankings has typically been from number 15 to 20 um, uh, compared to other nations. And, and they've been pretty much at, at that very same spot. And, and despite having, you know, this uh, enormous uh, sovereign uh, fund, um, and I will soon go over to discuss with Christian Fiesler as well, but um, what, what's your comment? Is Norway spending enough uh, on research and, and should our sovereign fund um, perhaps be allocated more to research than, for example, buying premium properties in, in London? Dr. Gibrande, please. Um, thank you. I, I think we uh, are very privileged to have the sovereign wealth fund and the real interest of the sovereign wealth fund is now uh, the main income in our annual state budget. So I, don't, I, 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 I would keep the sovereign wealth fund as it is, in the sense that um, we should uh, make it even uh, bigger to accumulate, but more of the real interest that is allocated to the state budget, that is more uh, is 50% of the GDP of Norway, more of that should be invested in what can create future jobs and economic growth. And here, uh, I think we are also too narrow uh, in arguing for research and development. I've been through many of these discussions through 30 years in Norwegian politics and say, yeah, but you know, how much comes out? There's also uh, not all research and development is efficient and all this. That might be true. We maybe can do better there too, but if there is one area where I would make more resources available is on research and development, because that is what we will have to uh, live off uh, in the future. 
And with the cost uh, picture we have in Norway, we have to produce higher up in the value chain. That's only where we can compete, and it's increasingly so. So um, I would be uh, the leading country in the world when it comes to using uh, money on R&D. Uh, why not? Uh, why should we only be the leading country uh, in the world on some other expenses? This is really, really the best investment we could do um, for uh, the future. So full support uh, from my side. And a good starting point, I, 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 I saw, I think, in one of the Norwegian uh, papers that I read last night, uh, that uh, the government is now expecting uh, hundreds of uh, billions of uh, increased uh, revenues because of uh, the unparalleled energy prices. At least use part of that uh, to R&D and not increasing the permanent expenses on the state budget, but have this as uh, an investment um, for the future. So this is the new sovereign wealth fund should be the R&D. Uh, that's, um, we have the sovereign wealth fund and this uh, should be uh, the, the things we should then uh, pay for the Norwegian Welfare uh, Society um, in addition to the sovereign wealth fund uh, in the years to come. Wonderful. Um, put, and if I may, um, you know, it would be great if you put what you just said in the tweet and sent it to you and also God Störe, our prime minister here in Norway currently. Well, um, over to you. You think, he would, it, you think uh, he would read it? You, he, you think he would have time to read it? Um, he normally responds to everything he gets. Um, Okay. Okay. Yeah. I, I, I'm not promising to do it, but uh, uh, I, if, if I did it, I, I would. Uh, what's even more important than reading it would be to follow up on it. And there, the jury is out. We will give him the the benefit of of the doubt. Okay, that's good. Um, so Hege, as you said, so uh, Kongsberg and Kongsberg Digital, uh, you know, uh, are our companies that actually are high up in the value chain and. Uh, sort of echoing what Berger Brenner just said, it's important to invest in in uh, in research and, and development. And I know that Kongsberg uh, has been doing so. Um, uh, but do you see a need for investing even more into research and development? Or uh, well, what, what's your thinking about a feed, a feed like artificial intelligence, for example? Yeah, so uh, just on a, a general comment, I would say that uh, we are investing quite significantly. Uh, so if you look at uh, Kongsberg Digital alone, we have been in between 25 and 30 percent of the annual uh, revenue uh, into R&D. Uh, and you also see quite high numbers across Kongsberg. Uh, when it comes to investments, uh, one thing is the number that you are invested. Uh, another thing is how targeted you are uh, with those investments uh, when it comes to some of the key issues that we are facing now. Uh, and on that, I would especially say the energy transition uh, part. Uh, because if you look at uh, um, Norway, we are quite dependent on uh, traditional energy uh, still. Um, so uh, I think that uh, that's some opportunities in there. Uh, and then uh, lastly, I would say um, it's also important how efficient you are setting up the different programs, uh, because I think some companies now, and this, there is a good dialogue established around it, uh, but you find the programs uh, to be uh, too rigid uh, and too uh, time consuming uh, in many areas to so be very narrow on the feedback. So let's let's talk a little bit more about artificial intelligence, and then I'll invite my uh, great colleague Christian Fiesler, professor at the Norwegian Business School (BI), to come on uh, this panel. Um, so um, uh, Christian uh, Fiesler is uh, one of the co-directors of the Nordic Center for Internet and uh, Society (NCIS). And uh, it's been doing uh, quite a lot of work on artificial intelligence and also been uh, very successful in attracting research funding, both from EU and from the Research Council of Norway, and also having had uh, several excellent publications together with colleagues. 
so Christian, um, and feel free to uh, use some slides if you want, uh, share some slides with us. Uh, Let's, let's hear a little bit from the Nordic Center for Internet and Society at BI Norwegian Business School and, and, and tell us a little bit about uh, uh, research on artificial intelligence and, and what you consider the most important things there. So you have about four or five minutes. Uh, Lovely. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Peter and everyone for the very kind introduction. So I, I, I think what uh, our colleagues and, and we find really, really interesting in regard to the digital transformation is that um, we're both speaking of uh, technological innovations, but also about um, social innovations, right? Or the need to um, create a new digital society, which at least appears to people somewhat equitable. And what we observe in recent years um, is arguably a little bit of an uneven with how we design our upcoming digital society, right? That ranges from that proverbial throwing rocks at the Google bus or matters of, for instance, winners and losers in this digital transformation, the people that do have the skill um, to um, to profit from, from that to people who are more subjected to technology without having much of a say to that. And um, arguably, technology has become a bit of a contested terrain. So what you see here to the right is, for instance, an artificial rendering of anti-surveillance makeup. And um, we might, um, if we are not really advocate enough uh, with a broader society, arguably come into a realm of tech clash, essentially a uh, kind of like feeling where a large part of the society might not really believe in um, that arguably very, very potentially beneficial transformation, right? And um, right now, I think, especially after two years pandemic and this, um, um, and, and uh, Borge, you also mentioned that to this um, quite a large shift in wealth and who can profit from, from, from digital goods and, and all that. We, we might um, essentially now enter a, um, an era where there's a little bit of an undercurrent of suspicion that pervades discussions involving tech companies, their technology, but also, of course, municipalities and public bodies who want to employ technology. Interestingly enough, at least for us, um, uh, are then efforts between AI developers, policymakers, workers to find or to define some type of new social contract, right? How do we, in this new digital world, how do we want to handle transparency, fairness, non-maleficence, non responsibility, privacy, in a way that is both pervasive to um, people having a say, but also not opposed to innovation and experimentation and tinkering, right? Kind of how can we uh, combine um, yeah, innovation um, or also innovation in the way that we want it, right? Because arguably we are in a global competition between uh, different societal makeups, right? That there's a different way of doing, for instance, innovation in Europe composed to America, composed uh, opposed to, to Asia, right? And um, but what we find really, really interesting in, in observing is um, how different nationalities or different companies position themselves in terms of their vision that they have for AI. So what we what we're doing right now, we're reading all of the AI policy documents. There are around 200 from them, ranging from nation states, ranging from um, non-governmental organizations, and arguably. Um, the best ones of them, the ones which resonates the most, and I think which is a really, really interesting discussions to be had or kind of like a very fruitful way of involving and energizing people for transformations are those that combine three things. On the one hand, um, policies, policy talks, engagement offerings around technology that establish some sort of normative direction, right? Kind of like imagine companies essentially um, at least acknowledging that there are value-led in terms like transparency, fairness, but also talking about responsibility, right? Somebody somewhere in society taking responsibility to design transparency well, to trans to design equity well. Um, what is also quite powerful are um, organizations that somehow connect the current digital transformation with for instance, um, values, right? Because arguably different nation states, different regions design transformations differently. 
the better we are able to connect that to values like the Nordic model and or previous transformations, the better it is. And um, also an important factor in making an equitable digital transformation is to somehow promote sustained action. So essentially to work on the one hand with real discussions about the trade-offs which we're doing. Um, so kind of like, is it for instance more important to uh, save on energy and or to have large data centers, large elaborate of AI technologies when it arguably is very, very well suited to solve big grand challenges, right? Do we want to solve cancer or do we want to save energies, right? And these discussions are some which need to be had when we are kind of like talking about uh, maybe medium term or medium large kind of like grand challenges. Also um, kind of like instilling a notion of care, right? Essentially making it, and that is my concluding word, to um, create some discourse around AI technology, which um, to the average citizen doesn't make it appear as some type of unchangeable effect of nature, essentially like whether um, to use to use uh, to use an um, to, to use an image to AI hopefully is not some type of meteorite which fell from the heaven and we have to essentially accept it as it is, but rather see AI and by proxy our digital tools, the digital infrastructures which we're building as something which is more akin to a lump of clay, so something which we can shape and the we being um, uh, in a sense kind of like an open invitation for me, more people to uh, to contribute or be able to contribute. With that having said, Thanks for having me. Thank you uh, so much, Christian Fiesler. So uh, could I invite some brief comments from Berge Brand and Hege Skriset to, to what uh, Christian uh, just uh, presented? Any reflection or observations in, in, in his quick but pointed uh, yeah, five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think um, AI technology has been around uh, for many decades already, uh, but now it's shaping up. Uh, so if you look at what we are using uh, AI for, it's uh, really computer vision and, and also uh, into uh, machine learning. Uh, so uh, it's for energy uh, saving. Uh, it's for uh, production optimization, it's for predictive maintenance monitoring to, to become more automated on, uh, on assets and vessels. Uh, so it's becoming now a vital uh, technology. Then, of course, there are uh, some aspects to it uh, when it comes to uh, consumers uh, and uh, information gathering and information boundaries uh, that are more challenging. But from an industrial purpose, I think this is really now starting to shape up. Very good, Ben. Well, thank you. Thank you uh, for our excellent uh, presentation, uh, Christian. You managed to cover a lot uh, in uh, five minutes. Uh, a couple of points. Uh, first, on this wealth trickling down. Uh, piece and the technology companies. You know, many of the technology companies have been like become private superpowers. They are uh, also the modus operandi has been like the winner takes it all. So if your platform is the, the preferred one, you also uh, play a very uh, essential uh, role. That's uh, as an observation. And uh, I think we should then uh, look at. Uh, AI, maybe independently of what we have of discussion around the social media platforms, because I think we will need uh, to have a serious discussion if we need um, a bit more of discussions around how you can construct uh, algorithms. I think we have seen now also uh, with uh, the war in Ukraine that is low cost uh, to interfere also with uh, the democratic discourse in uh, countries, and I think uh, we can ask, uh, will uh, democracy, like we know them today, be able to survive unregulated uh, social media platforms? So then to uh, more uh, the specific uh, pieces on uh, the AI, and uh, I agree that um, it's more like a clay uh, than a meteorite. It's, it's, it's not like something that we cannot form. And also, as uh, Hege alluded to, uh, AI can be a force of good. It's not totally 
um, you. We have used it um, also in the past. But the power uh, of uh, AI, when you use it uh, in the most sophisticated ways uh, today, um, is a game changer and can change processes like the Industrial Revolution changed processes in its time. I think uh, things can be uh, made much more efficient and part of the jobs that are done by humans in the past can now be done more efficiently uh, by uh, AI. But as long as it's kind of doing jobs that free up time to do things that uh, are more meaningful or more consequential for human beings, it's fine. But the problem in a polarized world, like we're, do we're seeing now, where uh, big nations are not agreeing and they're really competing, there is no, it's harder to agree on some traffic rules for the use of AI. And if we were able to agree that we put AI into the interests of humankind, it will help us in, in fighting climate change, it will help us to fight criminal gangs, it will also help us um, in uh, a lot of um, things that uh, we, it's in our common interest, then it's fine. But if it's then used uh, without any ethical rules, it's like uh, the Wild West and we will do anything to compete with our competitors, then I'm more worried. Uh, so, uh, and I think we need to have an informed discussion on how, what, what, what are the main areas where AI can really get out of uh, control. And, when the, and if the gene is out of the bottle, it's hard to put it uh, in there again, as, as we know. And we should not be complacent about that situation. Christian, can I invite your, your comments to what Berge Brendt and Hegges said just, uh, just uh, contribute it? Yeah, no, I, I absolutely agree. Um, and to, to be non-controversial on that, but um, I, I think that like the discussion which we which we need to have around the digital transformation is um, I, I kind of like also go, kind of like going broader to 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 these discussions which were happening kind of like half an hour ago. But um, how can we um, get people excited to participate in the digital transformation? Right, that uh, starts from essentially people tinkering with technology, experimenting with technology. Um, yeah, essentially taking ownership on a, on a large level about, about this technology, right? I think right now we're still suffering a little bit that lots of people essentially see the digital transformation of, as either something that happens to you or something which people let just happen, right? And um, if you can find somehow ways to yeah, kind of like make people excited about coding, about tinkering, about uh, participation, about, um, yeah, it's essentially trying out things, right? I think that would be kind of like a really a best case scenario about digital transformation, which arguably also on the other hand, kind of like means that um, these systems which we're building right now, how open are they, for instance, for co-innovation, for adaptation? So do we want to build um, a digital society which is essentially governed more or less by very few institutions or can we build some type of commons, right? Where, um, yeah, more people can have an active share in in building that that future society. Yeah, and and if I might contribute a little bit about my my take on digital transformation, I think it's very important for uh, companies and organizations to to ask the right questions mm -hmm. instead of us doing empirical studies of companies that have succeeded or failed and try to extrapolate the, the, those actions into the future. So um, I think that transformation ability is something that is very important for uh, companies uh, to work on. And I have assembled uh, what I believe is a set of the most important, in other words, key questions for developing transformation ability. And uh, this is part of what I'm uh, doing in my uh, research time, will result in a book on Routledge in the fall or so. So uh, just very quickly uh, point out some, some questions um, that companies and organizations around the world uh, should work on or consider working on. One is how uh, organizations can prioritize innovation and digital transformation and get that higher up their own internal agendas. 
how to create network effects on multi-sided digital platforms. Uh, we, we, we do have some platforms in the US, but we're too few in Europe and in Scandinavia. We, we need to learn about how to apply digital technologies uh, to create value, for example, like Christian just presented. And when should we apply open innovation, design thinking and customers in the innovation uh, process? I think also uh, how to create value through service innovation and circular thinking is interesting. Uh, the Norwegian uh, company Tiber is one great example of service innovation. So is Oskilom. Um, how to survive digital disruption is, is a question that uh, companies need to uh, address uh, before other companies address that for them. And then how to create a culture for change and for innovation uh, is essential. Um, I also believe that how to lead uh, a digital transformation, uh, digital innovation projects professionally, uh, and I'll create a summary of all of these, but the, these are the questions that I will point to as um, essential questions and that I try to sum up the essential responses to each of these questions in, based on the foremost literature around the world and try to sort of turn these into um, recommendations for firms and organization uh, in a book uh, entitled Digital Transformation and, and Innovation. But anyway, these are um, questions I hope uh, the persons listening in could address uh, and, and could high up on their uh, own agenda. Uh, just to give you a little brief picture, um, of, of, um, part of the work we're doing here at the Norwegian Business School as well on this topic. Um, well, anyway, we are um, approaching the uh, uh, end of this um, uh, webinar. And uh, let me, let me uh, uh, invite just some um, final comments and, and, and your thoughts um, uh, about uh, the future six to 12 months out. Um, uh, how optimistic are you in terms of digital transformation and in terms of uh, democracies surviving? Uh, maybe, maybe, I, maybe I can try and take the digital transformation and then you can continue, Berger. But... Uh, I, I'm uh, quite optimistic, actually, uh, because uh, what, what I see in the industries that we are working with uh, is that um, it's a, a very open ecosystem approach. Uh, so, so that's what we also are um, 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 offering in the marketplace. Uh, but I think the most important part is that uh, uh, I think that the, the barriers for collaboration uh, across uh, multiple companies has been lowered. Uh, and that's essential to make this happen. You have to contribute with innovation and innovation funding across multiple companies uh, to make it happen within one industry. And then you have to look at the value chains, uh, not only the company specifics. So Christian, what do you say? How optimistic are you in the next six to 12 months regarding uh, development of digital transformation and, and, in a way, and AI for, let's say, development of the good? In six to 12 months, it's maybe kind of like uh, <laughs> quite a difficult time right now, but uh, give it a year or more. So I would be very optimistic simply because um, we kind of like as human beings, right? We're actually quite amazing long term to do the right things, I think, with technology. Most likely, if you ask now for the next six months, maybe there's some bumps in the road, but uh, for unfortunate reasons. But long term, I think we, we can do just fine. I think especially because everybody in organizations has more or less kind of like seen that we need to make it more participative but there's great political drive in there. I, 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 th I think we're getting ever more so better. Okay, and then finally, so we should probably look a little bit for out in six months. So if I might end this uh, webinar by asking you, uh, how optimistic are you uh, in, in terms of uh, our global situation and for the democracies to uh, develop uh, for say one year out to two year out? Uh, I think uh, democracies have shown uh, that uh, there uh, is limits to what uh, they do accept. Uh, 
uh, and uh, the Ukraine uh, invasion was such a watershed uh, moment. Uh, democracies came together and uh, the economic sanctions that are now launched against Russia, we have not seen uh, anything like it um, in modern time. Uh, so um, this, I think, has made many democracies uh, think uh, twice and uh, has led to uh, much more consciousness around also the value of a society where we are able to freely speak our mind like this uh, in a discussion. That's not every place in the world that that is the case uh, these days. So we have a lot to protect and uh, I hope the democracies also know, uh, know that uh, it is uh, a lot at stake. So unfortunately, uh, what happened in Ukraine has uh, then led uh, the, the unfortunate situation in uh, Ukraine that I think we all have condemned uh, has led uh, to increased consciousness around it. So I, I think I land there because now I'm already one and a half minute late for my next uh, Zoom call. So it's also in self-interest. But thank you for uh, putting this together. Yeah, thank you. Thank you all. Hegis uh, Kisset, Kirsten Fiesler and Berge Brende. And thank you to uh, persons who uh, listened in to us. Thank you.